All right, so for this uh, screencast, we're gonna be looking at some of the sample questions that are in the packet. And if you haven't had a chance to go through them, I'm just gonna give you some quick ideas as to how to go about responding to them since we're coming to the end. We have one more week on this thing and then uh, Monday is your exam. So here we go, question 1B. Despite the recent enactment of the First Step Act, a federal law aimed at reforming the criminal justice system by reducing prison sentences for nonviolent drug offenders, there are still numerous state and federal laws that can result in excessive prison terms. One such law is the Armed Career Criminal Act. This law, designed to keep violent offenders off the streets, features extreme sentencing enhancement guidelines that limit the sentencing options available to judges. So this is a kind of a mandatory sentencing situation. As an example, a Florida man was recently convicted of Ill illegally possessing a firearm as a felon. His sentence was lengthened in the ACCA because he had multiple convictions for nonviolent drug offenses. So these are probably possession type offenses where there wasn't any violence, yet he still got convicted. What would be a three-year prison term under Florida law was automatic, automatically extended to mandatory minimum sentence of 10 years. So that's a long time because of his prior nonviolent convictions. By the way, this is an actual Supreme Court case that is uh, in this session, so we should know by June or July how they're going to rule on this. And I just gave away the, the answer. Identify a power the Supreme Court could use to address the situation in the scenario if a case were appealed to the Supreme Court. Well, this should be a no-brainer. The Supreme Court has the power of judicial review. The Supreme Court can review the constitutionality of the Armed Career Criminals Act and determine if it's fair within the meaning of the Constitution and the Eighth Amendment comes into mind, uh, cruel and unusual punishment, which is what I would imagine, that whether this law is just overburdensome for judges in limiting their options. So this guy may have been, you know, who knows, maybe he just had a run of bad luck in the past and did drugs and then suddenly he's, uh, maybe he finds a need for a, a weapon and, you know, who knows. But uh, anyway, 10 years, a long time for that particular situation when three years would be the sentence otherwise. So, so you want to talk about judicial review here. In the context of the scenario, explain how Congress could respond to the power described in Part A. Well, Congress may, let's suppose that the Supreme Court overturned the Arms Career Criminals Act. Congress could rewrite the law to make an exemption for nonviolent drug offenses or something like that. So you always want to refer to the scenario. And then the context of the scenario describe how interactions between linkage institutions and the president could influence public policy. You can edit any mistake there. Um, so linkage institutions are interest groups, the media, a number of things. But then again, that's beyond the scope of the exam, so I don't want to get into it too much. But basically, what could the president do in this situation? Um, the president could, maybe he doesn't like what Congress signed or what Congress did, so he could sign it into a signing statement or he could veto the legislation or the president could give a speech and use the bully pulpit. So just think of all those things that presidents can do, not just formal powers, but also the informal powers that they have. He could feature it in the State of the Union. He can invite people to the gallery in the State of the Union who have you know, unjustly convicted under the law or something like that. So again, uh, kind of keep these responses fairly short and sweet, keep them simple. You're only gonna have 15 minutes to respond, so you don't have a lot of time to um, monkey around with uh, your responses. You gotta cut right to the chase and think about what are these powers that these institutions have. Okay, so question 1C is one of the ones that was assigned regarding fentanyl and how it's currently classified as a Schedule II, meaning it has an accepted medical use, which is basically to knock people out during surgeries. And yet people are dying in droves because people have been using illegally synthesized fentanyl. So what can Congress do? Describe an action Congress would take to address the situation in the scenario. So a lot of you wanted to reclassify uh, fentanyl as a Schedule One narcotic. The problem with that is then it is said to have no accepted medical use, and it does have an accept accepted medical use. So probably, you know, Congress would be more looking at a law that would 
you know, crack down on, on the illegal activity, make it a serious felony, sentencing enhancements, things like that. So, and they could hold hearings. So one of the strategies for these questions is to, you know, create a, an insurance point. So don't just talk about Congress could pass the law. That's the low hanging fruit answer, which you always want to go with, by the way. But prior to passing any legislation, Congress could schedule hearings to discuss the issues related to the fentanyl crisis and on and on and on. Okay, part B, in the context of the scenario, explain how the action described in part A could be affected by the bureaucracy. Well, the bureaucracy in this case would be the agency involved with enforcing the drug laws. So the ATF, perhaps, uh, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. Uh, it might be a, a bunch of things. It could be the FDA. So if Congress was genuinely trying to reclassify fentanyl as a Schedule One narcotic or something like that, you can bet that people in the doctors' communities would be going crazy and lobbying the FDA not to do it. So again, just make make some sort of connection between what the agency does in terms of writing rules and regulations. So uh, maybe the agency could strengthen the prescription requirements or, or tie it to some sort of licensing measure for doctors and, you know, something like that. But uh, think about the specific things that they would be doing. In the context of the scenario, describe how lobbyists, and again, this is probably not going to be asked, but lobbyists are people that have a vested interest in what Congress and these agencies are doing. So it'd be pharmaceutical companies, things like that. And of course, they would be trying very hard not to have fentanyl outlawed because they manufacture the stuff. So a lot of ways you could answer these questions is just think, focus on the powers that they have and the interactions between the branches. Question 1D is a question that I'm guessing some of you probably struggle with, but uh, let's go through it real quick. Describe the process that led to the Supreme Court's ruling on, to, on the challenge of the Affordable Care Act. Well, the process is that states who were charged with implementing the Affordable Care Act didn't like some of the provisions of it, so they filed lawsuits. And then the Supreme Court had to determine whether or not there was merit in those cases and grant certiorari and, and it basically agree to hear the case. So you're not going to have to worry about terms like a writ of certiorari, by the way, on the exam. They've kind of taken that out of the curriculum for some reason. But you do need to know that the court would agree to hear the case and just for good measure for of the court's justices would have to agree to hear the case. So that's basically the process. Four judges decide, wow, this is a big issue. Got 51 sta or, uh, 26 states uh, challenging it and different rulings in the circuit court, so we better settle it. So talk about these lawsuits starting in the district courts, making their way up to the circuit courts of appeal, conflict of rulings and how the case should be decided, and then the Supreme Court agreeing to hear it to settle those dis differences. In the context of the scenario, explain how the process described in A can be affected by the executive branch. Well, the executive branch can't do too much because the judges have independent provisions, but what they can do, and so here's what you want to talk about. You want to talk about the appointment power of the president because the president has the power to appoint judges and the president can go about appointing judges that he agrees with so that in the future they might decide differently. And you also want, for good measure, again, an uh, insurance point. The president could address it in a speech. And even though judges are thought to have independence, they're still human beings and they may be swayed by something the president says. Who knows? And then part C, in the context of the scenario, explain how the ruling relates to enumerated powers. Well, you have a law passed by Congress, the Affordable Care Act. And this law was basically challenged under the Commerce Clause. And what the court did is they said, well, the provision that everybody's freaking out about is this individual mandate where you're going to make people buy insurance, otherwise they have to pay a fine. And Justice Roberts basically said, well, Congress has the power to tax, and this is kind of not the way we normally describe a tax, but it's a tax, and therefore it's upheld. And so... Again, it relates to enumerated powers because at issue was, is this 
law even permissible under the Commerce Clause, or does it fall within the power that Congress has under the taxing authority, and that's what the court ruled. Okay, this question is one of my favorites, and I did write this question. It's about the new USS Ford and the decision to use these magnetic catapults, electromagnetic launch systems, and for the entirety of the history of the Navy, they'd use steam catapults, which are, you know, noisy. This takes a lot of fossil fuels to create the steam. And so this idea of a magnetic launch system seemed like a pretty good one. The only problem is they didn't work. And President Trump kind of jumped on that and said uh, the system was not good. And, of course, the USS Ford just has all kinds of design issues and I don't need to go into all of them right now. But uh, regarding this, okay, so let's, this, is, this is one of the few questions where I was kind of baiting people into talking about hearings. Describe a power that Congress or the president could use to address the problems presented by this scenario. So Congress almost certainly is going to hold hearings over this to determine whether the decision-making going into this new requirement of this aircraft carrier is a good idea. And the president, of course, could just simply use the bully pulpit as he actually did in real life to talk about this and how, you know, maybe we need to rethink this uh, expensive, incredibly expensive new system and whether it's actually worth it and and on and on. So either of those options, uh, or, or you could simply say Congress could use its lawmaking uh, power to require the use of steam in the future because it's more reliable or whatever. In the context of the scenario, Part B, explain how the use of congressional or presidential power described in A can be affected by its interaction with the bureaucracy. Well, now we're going to run into the biggest bureaucracy of them all, the Pentagon, the U.S. military. As we said earlier in another screencast, the military takes up half of the discretionary budget of the United States. So if they want this new technology, they're going to put up a fight. So, um, and don't forget the agencies are going to be very much um, influenced by the contracting firms that are building these things, these big aircraft carriers, because they may have a vested financial interest in the new technology or whatever the case may be. So again, you just need to talk about the interactions and how, um, the military may push back and, and may resist implementation or whatever the case may be. Part C, in the context of the scenario, explain how it interacts between Congress and bureaucracy and the industry lobbyists influence policy. Again, there won't be a lobbyist question most likely, but this is getting you to talk about an iron triangle and just discuss what we've uh, talked about with the iron triangle, where you have this policy made out of public view, probably not the best policy given the technology at the time, maybe eventually, but uh, maybe pushing it a little bit early. On the other hand, maybe that's how things happen. But um, when you have a policy failure and it's the result of an iron triangle, this is kind of one of those negative aspects of the iron triangle. So that's what you're going to talk about for part C. Okay, question 1M. This is another one that was assigned. Um, you have the president uh, doing a an agreement with North Korea. So let's skip right to the questions. Describe a formal constitutional power the president has related to this scenario. Well, the formal power, the only formal power is he has the power, well, he, I guess two of them, he's commander in chief. And he's also has the power to make treaties. So the formal constitutional power that relates to the scenario is really the treaty making power. So you're trying to get him to stop uh, with the missiles and whatnot. Part B, describe an informal power the president may use in the situation described. So this is the more likely scenario the president would do an executive agreement. That's kind of the poor man's treaty, which does not require Senate approval. And in real life, that is exactly what happened. And as we see in real life with uh, Kim Jong-un, assuming he's still alive, I guess there's a question about that now, uh, is launching missiles, uh, that seems to violate the spirit of whatever agreement they had. So you can see the weakness of those agreements and there's really nothing you can do about it. And then Part C, in the context of the scenario, explain how the use of formal p power described in Part A can be affected, with, affected by its interaction with Congress. And this is very simply getting you to recognize that a treaty requires a two-thirds vote of the Senate. Very, very difficult, which is why we don't see too many treaties throughout history. So, all right, that's it for that question. Pretty straightforward.